morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to bring this month's meeting of the Support Services Committee to order, and I'll start by, first I'll say that all those supervisors are sitting at their chairs. We only have members of the committee who will be uh, offering motions and voting. I know you know that, but just in case. Uh, I'll first accept, ask for a motion to accept last month's meeting's minutes, please. Motion made by Supervisor Sokol, second by Supervisor Driscoll. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried. We have uh, a few things on our agenda today, but the uh, first one we want to start with is the discussion of the quality of care in our community nursing homes. We've all seen various articles in the, in the paper about uh, the situation, and I'll remind everybody, and everybody's aware of this, this is not about me, this is not about the Board of Supervisors, it's not about the Department of Health. It's about the elderly who are in the nursing homes and their families and their quality of life. And here is an opportunity for us to step up and not to be uh, even quaint to say, let's have government for the people. And when the, the issue of the hotline first came up, there was some a little bit of uh, pushback because it would, it would change the way we do things. And that makes people a little uncomfortable because you just get settled into, all right, I think we have a, a handle on this, and then someone comes along with an idea we're going to uh, do something a little different. But just in the past two months, I've been uh, heartwarmed and impressed with the uh, embrace that the super, various supervisors have given to this issue of the quality of life of our elderly in the nursing homes and the bureaucracy. They have all recognized that We've been running this system for decades, hundreds of years, of how we take care of our elderly. And in, in the current time, it doesn't seem to be working as well, uh, perhaps by a long shot, that we would like it to work. So what I've found just in the past month is that the supervisors and the bureaucracies are all piling in, and they're trying to come up with a new way of doing things. Called a, it changes the paradigm, how we do things. We keep trying to do it, as you know, the definition of insanity, if you keep trying to do the same thing over and over and expect a different result, that's, that's crazy. Well, we recognize we cannot keep doing what we've always done and do it harder and expect a different result. So I'm amazed at the, uh, how everybody has said, we want to do something, we can do something about this and let's try to find some new ideas. We have a, a lot of folks here. There are a lot of administrators. They responded to the article that was in the paper. But we have some <laughs> family members who would like to address uh, the supervisors. And let me start before I introduce the first one. Uh, the idea of the hotline is not for necessarily for the county to be solving the problems. Right now, you can call New York State. They have a hotline. And you call them up, and you explain your problems, and then and it goes through the process. But it kind of loses its visibility. The idea of the hotline is that the visibility be right up front in all of our faces as far as the supervisors. And I know as politicians, you don't like to have this stuff in front of you. It makes you uncomfortable. And therefore, it causes you to take action. We would collect the, the data. There is a program that the city of Glens Falls uses called Civic Plus as a company. And if they need a sidewalk fixed, they go on onto the website and they type in exactly where the sidewalk is and they type exactly what they want to say. And if they want to think about it, they can think about it. The idea of the hotline is that they, if we could use this software, and I've gotten feedback from family members that they think it would be great because it would allow them to sit there and organize their thoughts and change them and modify them and say exactly what they want to say. As you know, when you call someone, half of what you tell them is lost in translation. And then when you hang up, immediately after you hang up, you say, ah, I wish I could have said that. By having the hotline where they can type these things in, they'll be able to do all, say everything they want to say and not second guess it. And they can go back and say it again. The next day, they can send another message. We would take those messages and then pass them on to, to uh, the health department. Now, from my standpoint, I would also like the supervisors to see these. Uh, I would like our uh, 
state representatives, Betty Little, Dan Steck, Senator Jordan, Assemblywoman Warner, I'd like them to see it. And when it comes to the executive branch of government in New York State, the person who's in charge, the governor. I want them to, all those people to know what's going on. And perhaps through that, the other systems will start falling in place at a greater rate and we'll start getting some happy families. We're always going to have complaints, but all right, you get a complaint, but don't wait three years to act on it or three months or three weeks. Sometimes you need action the next day. So this is going to evolve over the next weeks and months, but we're heading for a positive uh, end. I'm glad to see everybody here. We don't not, everybody's here not necessarily to speak, but certainly some, some are, and a lot of them are here just to see what's going on. So let me, I don't know everybody's names, but I do know this gentleman with the white hair and the green shirt, his name is Armando Saburia Arevalo. He lived here, came here when he was uh, a little bit younger, back in 1968, and he's uh, from El Salvador, but uh, I worked with him for 40 years at the hospital. Uh, he's quite a fellow, but he has his wife in the county center, formerly the, the Stanton, formerly the Hallmark, and he would like to. And he's actually the one that's been uh, pushing me to do something about this for quite a while now. So, Armando, if you would step forward and just identify, say your name and where you live, and adjust the microphone so it, the, yes, and uh, tell us what's on your mind. It's right here. Okay. <laughs> to say, just state your name and where you live. Yeah, good morning, good morning. and thank you for being here and appreciate. My name is Armando Arevalo, and I live here in Glen Falls. My wife is at the Glen Falls Center, who used to be a Stanton before, and uh, she's been there for over five years. <clears throat> One of my uh, major issues that I have is the lack of enough personnel, in particular on weekends. There are some weekends, the center has two wind, the West Wing, for instance, where she is, has two areas, and each area holds about 20 people, 20 residents, and when they are very well staffed, they have three aides. The three A's, their job is to get this resident out from bed, take it to the bathroom, clean them, dress them, take it to the place wherever they're going to have breakfast, for instance, in the morning, or they prefer to stay in their room. But it is impossible, even when they think they are full staff with three people, because remember, there are some residents that they need two individuals to take care of them because they are overweight and they have a lift to pick them out from bed and take it to the bathroom and so on, on. And if two people are busy taking care of one person here, they leave and one person on the other side, how can that person can take care of 20 at least? It's impossible. I have an issue with that. I have seen that. I have witnessed that many, many times because I've been there with my wife over five years. For that reason, I have plenty of experience in that respect. That's one of the issues. The other issue that I have is with the food that they provide to them. I personally, I have talked to the person who is in charge of the kitchen about these issues in the past. But it still is happening and nothing really has been improved. One of the issues, in the past, before the new company took over, the deal was seven o'clock breakfast. At seven o'clock, the trade should come and they will arrive on time at seven o'clock. Right now, they are coming. 7.30 or even later, one day after 8 o'clock, and they are sitting there waiting and waiting for the food to come. Today, I was there for breakfast with my wife. The tray came almost 10 off 8. 
you know, that is no fair. You better see them. You really have to be there looking at these people waiting and waiting, you know, for their food and the food very late. And that happened only for breakfast. It's also happening during the lunch time, and it also happened during the dinner time. One time, the dinner was, the first trade came around, supposed to be at 5 o'clock, but it appears the first one at 5.30 and the second one after 6 o'clock. And get this, one day it was a spaghetti dinner. Only six trays for the people in the dining room <coughs> came out, and the rest had to wait for more than half an hour. And I inquired, what's going on here? Why this dinner is so late? This is what I hear. They told me that they run off of spaghetti and they have to go to the store and get them. What? Huh? In an institution, that you have to feed 117 people. You have to plan properly to do this. This is what happened that particular day, and that is what I hear that was the problem, that was the dinner was delayed. One problem. Another problem is many, many times the food come out cold, cold, and that is not fair for them. And one particular day, the food was cold, and I asked, it happened to be the head of the kitchen was there, and I said, hey, what happened today? Why the food is so cold? And it wasn't just for my wife, it was for almost everybody that particular day. She said, oh, I took the temperature on the plate, and the plate was very hot, it was 140 degrees or whatever. Well, yeah, probably right after they got out from the dishwasher. <laughs> but by the time they put the food on, <coughs> on the plate, they must have been, you know, cold or stay there for a longer time that the food had time to get cold. You know, that is not fair. That's one issue. Another time, this has happened many times, on lunch in particular that happened. They brought the uh, <coughs> banana cream pie. And guess what? The banana cream pie just probably came out from the freezer and they put it on someplace there to defrost. By the time they put it on the table for the resident to eat, it just the top layer was defrosted. The rest was still hard. And for everybody, you know, just for us and many other people too, it's happening. And I addressed that to the head of the kitchen, and it still happened more than once. Two, three times it had happened. Another day for dinner was pizza, just a little tiny pizza that they, they serve there, which they are produced somewhere and they come frozen. Guess what? They were frozen. When they put it on the plate and serve it to the rest, frozen. Everybody was complaining about that. Of course, who will eat that? Huh? It's just impossible. And this particular situation, in my case, not too long ago, just a couple of weeks ago, the dinner was a spaghetti and meatballs. And this is exactly what happened. When I opened her plate, the cover from the plate, this is unbelievable. What happened is, I didn't see any spaghetti. It on the plate, only on the plate was a big plate or a mashed potato, and the, on top of the mashed potato, they put spaghetti sauce. What? Huh? Of course, I was furious about that, and I complained. Immediately, I don't wait. I have a big mouth and immediately go. What is this? This is not the way to treat our people. Huh? I don't think so. And this is what's happening. I would like to see some definite changes. I don't want to hear promises, 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 because I've been hearing that for years, and nothing really affected us. This is what's happening. Huh? I'm on a question. When you were talking about the full staff, there's not enough people, not enough staff when they're fully staffed, and when they're not fully staffed, 
you're really hurting. What happens uh, to the residents if they're not they have neglected because and it's not the the age a decision. I mean, it, because they want to neglect, it just there's only so much they can do. Because there are times it has happened because I am there all the time. One person for each side and one person for the other side. Huh? How can the one person take care of 20 people? It's impossible. And the, someone has to be left behind. Someone has to be neglected. It's not because they choose to neglect that. It's just because it's only human beings. And that's only so much they can do. And when you say neglected, what do you mean neglected? Neglected because they are still in bed and they can go over to get them out from bed in the morning and clean them and take it to the toilet, blah, 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 the whole thing before breakfast. That's what I'm talking about, neglect. Neglect is because they, they don't have a time to go there and get them out from bed, you know, and clean them and then take it out and dress them to go for breakfast. That's what I, I mean by neglect. But I agree. I am not blaming them. It's not their fault. It's only so much that one person can do. It's only so much that person can do. Hey, Supervisor McGowan. Oh, yes, I, I have a question. Uh, over, uh, you've been there for five years. So uh, how have you seen the quality care over the, the five years and, uh, you know, uh, and also through the transition uh, with the new ownership. Has, it, uh, has it's a, it gotten any better or has it gotten worse? It's a very good question. Because when we first started, for instance, they have plenty of people there, full staff to take care of the residents. They will four people to on each side. And after that, you know, the whole thing has been getting down, 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 down. And right now, the quality of care has decreased tremendously, tremendously because the lack of staff is not enough staff. You know, and I have hasn't improved. It has been getting worse. And also the the staffing, the food was right on time, very good, nutritious food. That's another thing. The nutrition. What? They are still serving processed food, which you all know that is not good for anyone. Processed food is not good because it's full of chemicals and salt. A lot of these people are, have high blood pressure. And now we are feeding them bologna sandwiches, uh, turkey sandwiches with our processed food. No way. I have complained about that in the past, but they're still doing it. I don't think that is fair. That has to be eliminated completely. In the past, they never was all this bologna sandwich or any turkey sandwich from processed food. It was real, real good, but right now it's not. Any other comments or questions for Mr. Raybro? Okay. Anything else you'd like to add, Armando? Uh, no, I think that more or less I touched. <laughs> all right, very good. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, thank, thank you, you, thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to? Yes, ma'am. You state your name and <laughs> where you live, but also your official position. Thank you. <laughs> My name is Aislinn Smith, and I am the newly appointed administrator for Glens Ball Center. I'm from Rhinebeck, New York. I live in Rhinebeck. And for the record, Glens Ball Center is where? It's in Glens Falls. It's the former Stanton home, and it's okay. the home where Jane resides the resident that we were just speaking with. Okay, oh. very good, thank you. You're welcome. I'd just like to say that um, I am new to this position, so to walk into something that was not familiar to me in this level, I had no idea the community felt so, so concerned about this home when I took charge. Um, I do not share the same concerns, and as a licensed administrator, I would not have taken this position if I felt I was putting my license on a wall that was going to put me at risk. Um, I am a single mother. I drive up here to commute because I do care very much about that home. I feel very strongly that this industry does not need further regulation. Um, I know the resident very well. 
she's actually got a birthday today. She's turning 80. Um, as an administrator, the things I enjoy doing are resolving problems. I am a Johnson & Welch graduate. Center has actually recruited me because I have a food service background. I owned a food service business for 13 years in New York State. Um, they recruited me because I am not experienced right now in long-term care and I am not nervous about leading this. I am in no way unfamiliar with the issues of long-term care. What returned me to this business is my father was just admitted to a nursing home. So he resides in a nursing home in Dutchess County and I can tell you completely these are not issues that are isolated to any particular nursing home. They're widespread, they're national, they're international, and they're about to get worse because the aging population does need quite a few resources, and we're not equipped to do that. At this time right now, if we continue to regulate this industry in the way we do and put paperwork or add another level of oversight, I'm going to not be able to eat breakfast with my residents. I won't be able to go to activities and dance or hear them. I won't be able to hug my family members. I don't think that for a second we need to do any other thing other than improve the current system. We have a State Department of Health that comes in to regulate us. I did just go through a survey in Glens Falls Center. It was actually a very good survey for what I would consider. Our issues were administrative. We did not receive one tag from the Department of Public Health for food service issues. We did not receive one tag for staffing issues. My building is no different than any other building. But what people don't know when they read articles that are in the public press is that it's not a facility, it's a home. We don't come to work to ruin people's lives. We come to work every day because we want to be part of the solution. I have to be part of this coalition you can hear it in my voice, how passionate I am. I don't want to harm people. I don't want to work on weekends thinking that I'm doing something wrong. I also do not want to continue to read the Post Star and be expected to be able to recruit people into an industry where being attacked is a regular. I don't think for a second that by writing articles about the harm and this scare tactic we use to scare our elders into aging, I do not believe that is appropriate. I think we need to change the philosophy, make it more hopeful. People want to come in and volunteer or tour the home or attend an activity or have a meal. I would love to greet you at the door. There is an open invitation. I actually have two doors on my office. They're always open. I'm a hugger. I'm a lover. I'm not here to harm people. I am the license on the wall for Glens Falls Center. I put it on the wall and I'm keeping it there. So we all need to get to know one another because I'm part of the solution. And when the articles hit the paper and when we talk about the poor quality of care, it's directly about the staff I have. Myself, I invited my property management service director, my environmental service director, Mark. He's been with our, our home now for almost 45 years. He started when he was a baby. Um, I have Fran. She's worked for centers now for number, numbers of years, different homes. She's our activities re recreation service director. We have parties like you would not believe. I, I do want you to know what the reality is. At the same time, I'm not ignoring any of the concerns that Armando has brought forward because again, I'm there to fix those. And I work with him as closely as I can. I am sorry that you feel the way you have. I understand where your feelings come from, but at the same time, I do want to acknowledge that we are part of the solution. So I appreciate you listening to me very much. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much, Aislinn. Uh, but don't leave. I think uh, Supervisor Weil has a question, please. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for coming today. I'm not providing you some time. Um, I have a question. In my sense, in my experience, a lot of this has to do with finance. Can you tell me? Um, what you pay your typical staff member on the floor. Not nursing. The CMA? Yeah. That has been accurately
quoted in the post star, the rates that have been established are our current rates. I believe they start around 1250. I don't know off the top of my head exactly the nursing rate, but they do go up based on experience and so and they are competitive to based on our regulatory reimbursement. And so I'm just curious, how many open staff positions do you have now? So what I will say, and I'm bragging, thank you. Um, it, when I started last year, we had a turnover rate that was significant. And in January, we had a turnover rate that was less than 1%. I've basically locked the team in and told them that this is a different home now. They're there for a reason and we work together. We don't have a tremendous turnover going into this year. You have to remind yourselves I started November 20th, so I do have my work cut out. Um, but in the month of January, we were able to recruit 15 new CNAs. And we are in the process of focusing our RN and LPN recruitment, working with BOCES programs, working with the community Adirondack um, Community College had come in. So just to follow up, you, you recruited 15 new for January, but you still didn't answer how many open positions? Do you how many open positions for CNAs? I would say approximately three to five right now, but we use agency staff, so they're not truly open. They're being filled with temporary staffing that actually work in the building regularly. But in long-term care, across the board, in any home I've worked at, even in Massachusetts, I can speak to that, there are shortages everywhere. Think about wanting to work in nursing homes based on what you read. Would you pick a nursing home job as a new grad based on what you're seeing in a newspaper article? It takes an angel. And then we write these articles about these people that are trying their best and we attack. Supervisor Hogan. And then Supervisor Driscoll. Thank you, Aiden, for coming in. You're welcome. You reference solutions. Can you outline? What those are. So, so in my mind, it's hope, it's positivity, it's happiness, it's, it's calling things instead of recruitment and retention, we call it people people. We talk about staff appreciation and, um, and just being more lively. When we go at people, we don't do corrective action, we, or I mean disciplinary action, we do corrective action. Um, my theme for my home is slow, soft, and steady. You know, no one ages by being aggressive or fast and quick. You know, they're very paced and routine. We try to create that same level. Um, it's all about how we approach people. You know, my families, when I started, they were upset, and I cannot blame them. But by just sitting and listening and talking and, you know, sharing information and making them part of the process, we've had family members do some of the staff education in the last month so that they feel like they get the direct voice to the team. That's helped us a lot. Um, but as far as just changing the, the atmosphere and going out in the community, and for every time anyone comes in our home to visit, Janelle, you were there yesterday, that makes such an impact on my team. They want to see people come in and, and get to know them, not just hear things from the community about about opinions that no one's formed from within the home. Is that Do you have any specific plans to change the, the way the meal service is? Yes. Okay. So the vision. <laughs> you know, long-term care, there are so many different approaches. And what you said about quality of care changing in the last few decades or in the, since the last hundred years, I mean, it went from horrific to slightly better. I started in the 90s. It was not great, but there are culture organizations for long-term care. I would refer you to the Pioneer Network. They're based in Rochester, New York, um, or the Eden Alternative, for example. That's a, a philosophy of care. Centers around resident preferences and choice. Centers around empowerment and purpose development for the residents. Um, it's speaking directly to meal service, it empowers residents to be a part of their meal preparation, the menu planning. Also. You know, I hate food trucks. We talk, I don't want to see those either in our home. When we were touring yesterday for lunch, I made a point, don't look at those trucks, they're going away soon. There's no reason we have to do the way we do it in long-term care. But the vision comes from my mind as the administrator, not from a legislature, you know, not from the government. It comes from my ability to do what I know is best for my residents. And when we do change food service, the goal is that they can eat whenever they want to eat. And the processed food, I don't want to see it either. We have a beautiful garden in front of our building that I would love to harvest. 
But I cannot do that when I spend two weeks with a state survey team and then have to come in and answer to a different regulatory agency and then answer to another regulatory agency when in the meanwhile I've already done the investigation you're claiming has not been done within the first 48 hours because it's a regulated industry. So I don't need someone to tell me what else to do with an investigation. I need freedom to do what we all want to see, give purpose to our elders, provide them with an environment that promotes their life instead of putting them in an in institution. Supervisor Driscoll. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I find it a little bit ironic that we just came from um, a tourism uh, meeting where we, we talked a lot about communications and, and modes of uh, telling the story and, and uh, uh, um, increasing the number of, of tourists that come to this area as well as um, local residents that participate uh, in um, uh, all that we have to offer our resources. Um, uh, I'm a little, I, I thank both speakers for their, for their uh, uh, heartfelt presentations. Uh, I'm a little troubled uh, uh, to think that I'm here to, to resolve or to add um, additional um, uh, laws or regulations to this process. Uh, uh, I believe that this process needs uh, solid uh, planning communication skills. Uh, uh, our county professionals working cooperatively uh, with the professionals uh, from uh, these homes. Um, uh, I think that um, uh, I commend uh, our administrator uh, at last week's meeting for, for reading a, a story uh, from a local resident, uh, a veteran, who really appreciated the, the services that uh, that he had received. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, too often uh, we hear the, the negative uh, mm -hmm. stories of uh, any type of industry. Um, uh, apparently that's what people want to read in the newspapers or, or see on television. Uh, I, I see this uh, collaboration as uh, being long overdue, but uh, 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 designed to uh, bring people together, uh, discuss issues, um, uh, uh, come from different uh, perspectives on trying to resolve uh, uh, issues, improve the quality of, of living without pointing a finger and, and, and dwelling on, on the past, really moving forward and, and coming up with a solution uh, that could work not just here, but uh, throughout New York State, throughout the nation, throughout the world. Yeah. So uh, I commend uh, all of the individuals who have been part of this for, uh, you know, this is uh, uh, step one, and uh, uh, the ladder is, is going to be uh, uh, long to, to climb, but uh, I think we're heading in the right direction. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions for Aislinn? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I appreciate it very much. <coughs> Step right up. I'll remind everyone, uh, supervisors know, but uh, uh, in the audience, one of the issues that uh, started this discussion was the fact that we used to, the county used to own the Westmont across the street, and it was, uh, I believe our rating was four stars, and since we sold it, it has gone down to a one star rating. Is it? Well, we're at two stars, so we're making forward progress. But that's, that's a concern for the supervisors because they, we were proud of what we had before. We want to continue to be proud of the service we offer our community. Yes, sir, state, please state your name and where you live. Uh, I'm Ron Hens. I'm a resident at Washington Center, uh, bed uh, 27B. I share uh, my room with another Korean War vet. Uh, who happens to be in diapers, and uh, I've been at this facility for almost one year now. And uh, excuse me for for any Washington Center is a former Pleasant Valley in Argyle. Yeah. Okay. And Go ahead. the uh, I've lived almost 40 years in Corinth. I've also lived in Warrensburg, 
uh, at Lake George, and I believe that Glens Falls is in fact the uh, heartbeat of upstate New York. Uh, I'm now in Argyle. Uh, reminds me of uh, California, where I came from, where out of Oakland, which was a bedroom for San Francisco. Well. Now I'm in a bedroom for Glens Falls. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, even though I'm not a resident in Glens Falls, I care deeply about what happens here. Uh, and the, I think you've asked the most important question of all. What's going on here? And that's why I'm here. I, I, I'm not a uh, professional caregiver. I've worked uh, 30 years on developing MRI machines uh, in healthcare, uh, but most of our residents can't speak for themselves, and uh, I'm not really here to give a speech. The, the best way our residents have of speaking for themselves is through the pictures that get taken. And if anybody really wants to know what's happening in these uh, compromised uh, health care homes, uh, boy, you ought to go on Facebook, which I've been doing. Uh, and uh, all the way from uh, uh, Buffalo to Oneida to uh, Plattsburgh. <laughs> and the uh, what I find is that the wonderful things that are happening in my uh, nursing home, I, I, I find them also in these other nursing homes run by Centers Health Care. Uh, and uh, uh, lost the words. Uh, I brought some, uh, some of our uh, what goes on in uh, our nurse home, nursing homes with me. Uh, we just decided we needed some uh, a slogan for our outfit. And what we came up with was uh, oldies but goodies. <laughs> Top of the morning to you. Thanks for another day. Love thy neighbor and kiss me. I won't go into the others. <laughs> And the uh, if you if you go on take the time to go on Facebook, uh, all of these centers that I'm talking about have uh, a page on on Facebook. And uh, the reason I went into it was, uh, gee, am I the lucky one that just accidentally wound up in the right uh, centers healthcare? Uh, and and I find the same things going on. In, in every other one that I'm looking at. Now, some of them are not as big as we are. Uh, so when it comes time to take pictures, uh, there is an advantage in, in having more. Uh, we have 29 uh, veterans at uh, Center of Healthcare in uh, Washington. Uh, and rather than talk, I would far rather answer a question about what really goes on in a health and care. Any questions? Supervisor Leggett. What really goes on? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I brought some goodies with me. I want to leave them with you if I can. That would be fine. Thank you. Yes. Yes, please. The, uh, we, 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 we do have a question, so far as a while. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you for coming and presenting to us today. And uh, I, uh, I'm getting a, a little bit older myself also, and I appreciate the wisdom that comes with the experience that you have. And I'm curious, what do we need to fix? Uh, well, okay. When I, when I first showed up, at Washington Center uh, and went on Facebook. I found 
two negative uh, comments on there. And I said, uh-oh, wait a minute. I'm living here. I don't see anything I would change. <laughs> and I put the comment on there. Now there's about 18 other good comments to go with it. Uh, and the, uh, but honestly, what I do see is incrementally, day by day, everything keeps getting a little better, a little better, a little better. The Facebooks uh, that we have on, uh, on Facebook uh, keep getting better and better. Uh, Warren Center, they have an article about a 104-year-old girl uh, celebrating her birthday. And they've got a video on it, you know, and it just breaks your heart to look at it. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, thank you very much, Ron. I appreciate uh, it. Thank very you thank very you. much for the time. Yes, step right up, please. My name is Grace Fordresher. I'm the regional administrator for Centers Healthcare, and I oversee all of the facilities in this area from Plattsburgh all the way to Glens Falls. Uh, today I brought with me my entire team. They're the administrators, the directors of nursing, and they're extraordinary people. They have the hardest job that you could ever imagine. This is not an easy business at all. We are the second most heavily regulated industry in the world. That's crazy. So I brought them. I didn't want to do a lot of speaking today, but I want you to know that our biggest challenge is definitely staffing. And if you really want to help us, get people to come here, to move here to this area, to be nurses and CNAs. <laughs> yeah, because right now what happens is we have great people, we have average people, and we have some not-so-good people. And when we get rid of those not-so-good people, which is what we want to do, there's no one to take their place. We've started doing our own CNA classes at Warren Center, and it's for all of our facilities, but we have no way to do a nursing class. We want to attract people to come here. We currently move people from out of state to fill those holes that you heard Armando. Did he run away? Well, <laughs> Armando had her, his wife was had his birthday oh, today. That's right. So that's he right. wanted to be there for lunch and balloons and cake. Yeah, gotcha. So some of those holes that he was talking about, um, we, we want to fill them. So we'll move people here. We put CNAs. We'll put anyone through CNA class and we pay for it. We will put CNAs through nursing school to become an LPN and then an RN and even a nurse practitioner. We will do whatever it takes. Um, we house them here in the community. So what, what we really need to see happen is we need more people. Um, we staff our facilities the very best we can. And if you talk to the Pines or Fort Hudson or any of the other facilities, we recycle staff. So let's say Stephanie, my director of nursing at Warren Center, who's amazing, if she fires someone tomorrow, they're going to go apply there. There's just nowhere else to pull from. So that's what we could really use help with. And um, that's really all I have to say. And I just want to thank my team for being here because they are amazing people. Thank you. Any questions for Grace? Yeah. Supervisor Bramer. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Appreciate you taking the time. I'm wondering if. Um, Part of the solution could be increasing salaries for the CNAs. Okay, so we we did. In fact, I'm not sure if everyone knows, but we're union, so we just renegotiated our union contract. Um, we when we took over these homes, there was a contract in place, and um, that just expired. So many of our homes have, in fact, um, just increased their rates. Um, we do a, a scale, so based on, and I'm not sure. I think. Are you guys almost all the same, starting at like that 12-something range? And then they go up and up and up. I mean, I was looking, I was helping Brooke adjust some wages just last night um, since minimum wage went up. And what I realized is we, we have housekeepers in her facility that make $18 an hour. 
And that's extraordinary. They've been there for a really long time. Um, we also do things like offer a no frills rate. As you know, benefits are very expensive. A lot of employees don't need them. Uh, they don't need the vacation time, this, you know, whatever, or health insurance. We actually pay them a dollar fifty more an hour that we would normally be paying towards those benefits if they don't want them. So um, we would, in fact, increase rates. We we are not opposed to that. I think we we pay pretty competitively. Um, Fort Hudson does pay better than we do. But is that the right answer? Because their staffing is the exact same as ours. So if you go online and you look at CMS.gov, which is actual data from our payroll systems, you will find that all the nursing homes in this area, our staffing star rating is the same. So they're, they may pay a little bit higher. In staffing, if you look at them, they're all the same. And they may pay a little bit higher, but they don't have more staff. So is that the answer? If it is, we'll do it. I, I'm just thinking in order to get higher quality people, you would want to pay, pay a little bit higher rate. What are your aspirational staffing ratios? So right now, I would say for a six, and I'm going to employ one of my directors of nursing to jump up right now, but I would say for our 60 bed units, about a 1 to 10 ratio. Is that correct on, on in the mornings, right around there? So it's one staff member approximately for 10 people. Eight, eight, I'm sorry, eight to 10. They are going to beat me up if I say this wrong. <laughs> one staff for eight to 10. One CNA. Resident. Then Resident. for nurses on a 60 bed unit, you would have, could, could a director of nursing come join me? <laughs> so that's, that's pretty significant. Um, we are probably one of the only companies out there that have started um, trying to recruit RNs to even work on the floor on our medication carts, which is not the standard. Normally it's an LPN, mm -hmm. and we have been trying to recruit RNs to do that so we can even get a better quality of care. Um, the difference is they can do the assessments. Is it, is it true that RNs were fired when centers took over? No, ma'am. No, we didn't cut any staff that I'm, I, I've been with centers for a year, <coughs> and um, the reason why I came here today is because every time I pick up the newspaper, someone's saying something bad about us. And I'm gonna be honest with you, Kenny Rosenberg is the best man I've ever met. He, I would work for him, I would do anything for him, and I would guarantee you that everyone around this room would answer that the same way. They are an amazing company. Do you think that profits from the company are being funneled downstate? No. No, I don't. I've, I'm going to be honest. I've worked for two very large nursing home chains, and their entire worlds were built around financial statements. And how much money can you make and what can you do? That's not this company. I've never, we don't even look at that kind of stuff. We ask our administrators to focus on the quality of care and, and the customer service and your employee satisfaction because the people up top, they truly believe that employee satisfaction is the key to everything. When you have happy employees and you do great things for your employees and you take care of them, you're going to get great care for your residents. Do you think they would object to going to a not-for-profit corporation? That I can't answer. I, that's really mm -hmm. way above me. So, um, 2019 Yeah, 2019 Best Place to Work. We did just win that. We just got that distinguishing. From? Um, so we all, as staff, we were all emailed. I don't know who the outside company was that asked us to fill out um, a questionnaire about where we work. Um, and it was anonymous, so I don't know, you know who answered what. I know I answered. Um, I've worked for centers for two years. I'm an RN. I'm an ICU ER background. Um, I plan on retiring from centers. I plan on hopefully being a nurse practitioner someday. Um, we'll pay for you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love, I won't work someplace that I don't feel like we do a good job. I worked way too hard to get where I am to go to work and do a not good job and go home and feel good about it. Um, I work alongside with my staff if they're short. I know Stephanie works alongside her staff. We wear scrubs to work if 
it's short, as people are saying, and they need help with baths or feeding or meds on a cart, we do that. We all jump in. The other thing to look at is people coming into the nursing home are coming in sicker because people are living longer, but insurance companies are keeping them in the hospital less, and now they're saying to a group of people that used to only know geriatrics, now you have geriatrics with wounds and surgical, you know, big surgical incisions and multiple comorbidities, and don't let them go back to the hospital within 30 days. So this is where now we're having to build up our education. We're putting RNs on the cart to provide better care, but we're still, it, it's taking more time, and we're doing a good job at that. We really are. You, you re do you recognize, though, that there is that perception that there aren't enough people there, that people are being left unattended, that it's a the quality of care is, that I'm saying, what I'm hearing from you is that that's just a perception, that that's mm -hmm. not really accurate. How so do we think make sure that the residents do feel that you're there and you can take care of them in a quality manner? So I, I, I'd like to Go say ahead. one thing before we do that. So imagine that you can't get out of bed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? And you have to go to the bathroom. Yep. You buzz the button. You put the button on. Is, is five minutes too long? And, and I guess that's, so it's a, it's a perception. So I'm not, I, I want to get everyone there right away. Is that realistic? That mm -hmm. wouldn't happen in a hospital. So we're doing the best we can. I'm not saying that staffing is perfect, but I think that we staff pretty well here. I'm from Florida, by the way, where they're, they're one of the most regulated areas for staffing. They actually put in staffing um, requirements, and we staff just the same here in New York. So there's, there's no difference, even if there was something that passed. But I think that um, sometimes <coughs> expectations might be a little unrealistic when it comes to, again, I have to use the restroom, and I really have to go right now. One minute is too long. So h how do we fix that? You know, that I don't know the answer to. Um, I, I, I think we have staff. I think they 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 help. Can I just ask yeah. one more, Chair? One more, and then uh, yeah. the drift. Um, and maybe this is actually for our uh, for Ms. Jones. Does the public does our Department of Public Health go in and help people after they've been at the hospital? Do they go to the nursing home to assist with wound care or that kind of thing? No. no. Home from the skilled nursing home. Okay. So from a nursing perspective, our staff have the have the education to do the wound care and things like that, so we don't have to pull in outside companies. If it's somebody that's going home, we will then contact the Department of Health or or Public Health or Fort Hudson or HPR and say, I have this person going home, here are their needs, so there is a continuum of care. Mm -hmm. The other thing I was going to say about perception is, um, and like Grace was saying, having to wait, when for the last 75 years of your life you were able to do it by yourself. You, the people that move into a nursing home have experienced so many losses, not just you know family and friends passing away, but they've lost their home, their car, their dog, and now they're independent. So that one minute can feel like one hour that they're waiting because they can't get out of bed by themselves. Or, God forbid, they're not supposed to get out of bed by themselves, but they do, they fall, they break a hip. That's also, you know, that also looks negatively on us. Whereas the only answer would be if you have 120 residents, do you have 120 CNAs? I mean, that's just not, it, you can't do that. But when I have my mom home with me, it's one-on-one. -on -one. And that's sometimes what families and residents expect, and, and it's not realistic. So a five-minute wait, a ten-minute wait, could result in a lot of complaints. And I think there's a lot of emotion in a nursing home that people don't always realize. First of all, no one wants to be in a nursing home, right? No one wants to be there. And then you have your loved one, whether it is your spouse, um, it, it could just be a family member, a, a child. And there's a lot of guilt because they're not at home with them because they can't keep them there. There's sometimes there's anger, there's family dynamics, there's so many things that go into it. 
we're never going to care for a love. I mean, think about it. You care for your loved one, your child, better than anyone else in the world. And no one will ever match that. It's like your home cooking. It's like nowhere else in the world, right? It's, you have the best home cooking. You come into a nursing home, you have people on all different diets. We have dietitians there that tell us exactly how much food someone needs to eat, exactly what needs to be on that plate. But is there extra salt on there? Because I know I need extra salt on everything. It's who I am. I probably have high blood pressure. Um, but when you come into the nursing home, you have a doctor saying, no, you can't have any salt. So we don't add that to anyone's food. You know what I mean? So everything's just a little bit different. And, and we also find that families, um, like Armando, and, and, and we have so many of them at Glens Falls that are wonderful, they're used to seeing what their loved one did 20 years ago when they were independent. And they come in and they might say, oh, I want them to have this because this is what they always had. And when you put that in front of that, that patient, they say, I don't want it. But in their loved one's mind, that's, they do want it because that's what they always had. So we wrestle with resident rights. It's their right to say no. It's their right to want different food. So there's a lot of emotion, and I want everyone to understand that. It's very significant. And the people you see in this room are the people who take, who, who hear it every day from those loved ones, from those family members. Supervisor Driscoll. Thank you, Mr. <coughs> Chairman. Uh, recruitment of, of uh, qualified uh, individuals who also uh, have the passion and the, and the uh, work ethic to do the type of difficult work that you do is certainly um, consistent uh, across the board. Uh, I think that, that housing is also a component of, uh, of that, and I would invite um, uh, professionals here to um, uh, Economic Development Corporation uh, sponsored um, North Country Affordable Housing Roundtable on Wednesday, March 6th at the um, uh, at uh, 333 Glen Street, the Travelers Insurance Building at 10 o'clock. Um, Absolutely. Uh, one of the uh, uh, regional uh, um, ways that we're addressing that in the city of Glens Falls is, is uh, the building of what they call um, workforce development housing. Uh, that would be located within um, a short walk uh, to the center. And I, I think that... Uh, that your input uh, at that meeting, at that round table, would, uh, would be appreciated and, and, uh, and welcome. Absolutely, I would love to join. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, Supervisor Wild. Mr. Chairman, thank you, and I'll try to be brief. I have a one statement and a question. Um, I, I hear that this industry is very heavily regulated. The first thought that comes to mind is there were probably some things that were being done wrong that needed the regulation. Absolutely. So, uh, the question is, is that before us today is basically a question of whether or not we should set up a hotline or something to that effect to deal with complaints so we could address some of the problems of care. With that regulation, do you have a mechanism in-house that gets reported upwards outside of your organization in terms of the complaints and the issues that residents and family and others might raise that we might be able to tap into ourselves and see? Absolutely, um, and, and I think that's what Aislinn was alluding, alluding to when she spoke of the systems that are already in place. There's a couple of things. One, obviously, um, the Department of Health here, I know there was some mention of maybe them not following up, but I'm going to tell you right now, the Department of Health in this area, they're tough. I mean, they, if, you, if someone calls a complaint into them, they, they follow up on it. They have to. So there is that Department of Health Avenue. There is the ombudsman, and I know that that in this area, um, we don't have a lot of ombudsmen, but I have found the program to be wonderful um, throughout my career. Um, they come in and they help us a great deal. Um, on top of that, what I would encourage every one of my administrators and directors of nursing is, it, you keep an open door and you allow families and residents and you, you encourage them. We have a grievance and concern process. So if there's any issue you have, they come in, we're, it's, it's regulated. We have to write it down. We have to follow up on it. And then we have to come back to you and we have to say, are you satisfied? So we have that process internally 
they should be going to administrators and directors of nursing. They have a hotline for the ombudsman, and then they have the Department of Health. Um, so there are so many resources, and I think that's why when we talked about the hotline, um, having another one, I, I wouldn't have an issue with it. But what I don't understand is what would we do with it? What, what would, if, if someone called you and said, my food isn't hot, I, I don't like this, I don't like the food I'm getting, and then you call us and then we can't give you any information because there's a, it would be a HIPAA violation. We would never be allowed to communicate back with you about the situation. So what you're going to be hearing is one complaint or concern may or may not be valid. We could have already followed up on it. We could have already, um, lots of things could have already been happening, but we're never going to be able to let you know that. So that's my fear is that, and, and I like the concept and I think it's a great idea, but I think we need to think through it. Um, how does it work? Because I thought that's what, what the Ombudsman and Department of Health did. So I, I just, I, I'm just not sure how it works. Great. Uh, just to explain on the hotline, the idea is to raise the visibility. There may be other options. We're not looking for increased regulation as the health department uh, Janelle says, and, and Dee and, and Tammy, there are a lot of agencies and systems which are working independently, and they're looking at a new way of looking at things so that there can be more cooperation to get to the result that you're describing that you want. Now, I've been working with HIPAA since HIPAA was first written, and if we're involved with the process, then we're within the rules of HIPAA. So if uh, Ryan, he's not in the medical field, or Amanda is involved with the process of this hotline, they're involved with the process. They're not, they're not in violation of HIPAA, so you can communicate to them. Okay. Uh, you can communicate to, because you're communicating with someone who's part of the circle. You can't just walk out in the street and share that, but if someone's involved in the care, and this would be as far as the care, uh, then it's within the uh, regulations of, of HIPAA. But we're not looking for increased regulatory uh, control. We're looking for ways to improve the systems. Mm -hmm. And giving visibility, it's a natural thing. If there is visibility to an issue, those that are in charge of fixing it are going to be more reactive. It's, it, there's no way around it. And those who are in charge of the issues <coughs> universally don't want that to occur. I'm sorry, but that's just the way life is. As politicians, we know we would like, to know, sometimes we would like to be able to censor what goes in the paper. We'll only put in the paper what we want, because we want everybody to see, see good things about us. That's not realistic. People get upset, our constituents get upset, we get uncomfortable, and then we react and, and change the way we do things so that they are no longer upset. That's what we're trying to achieve here. I just wanted to add a little bit to that. I'm the director of nursing at Washington Center. Brooke is my administrator. Um, in that grievance and complaint process um, that Grace was speaking about, sometimes families bring them right to us and it can be something as, um, as you know, simple as my mom's glasses are missing or, you know, my food is cold, or I had spaghetti sauce on top of the mashed potatoes. Um, every one of those gets written up the same and gets taken with the same weight and gets acted upon immediately. If we can't find the glasses, we are purchasing new ones right away. Um, if the food was cold, we're finding out where the process breakdown was, and immediately, how are we going to fix that? And that's all written down, and that is communicated to the family. If it's and reviewed by the Department of Health. Absolutely. So when Department of Health comes in, which by the way can now be seven to ten grueling days, walking around looking at every piece of chipped paint on the wall that's taking the entire administration team away from the residents. Um, so the Department of Health asks for all of those as well. And then they're going to come back when those glasses didn't come back from the eye doctor fast enough. And they're going to say, here's the complaint, what did you do about it? We're now spending another three days saying, well, we immediately called and got a new pair. The three days we can't help, it 
that's how long it took those glasses to be made. Face it, people, I mean, I lose my glasses, but people with dementia, who knows whose drawer they're in somewhere because they've picked them up or set them down. Other things like the mashed potatoes with the spaghetti sauce on top may not even have been mashed potatoes. Just a thought, not a HIPAA. Mm -hmm. That might have been pureed spaghetti. <laughs> <laughs> that might have been that that person, because of a swallowing difficulty or no teeth, couldn't have real spaghetti. I mean, it's just maybe that happened. So maybe that was our answer on that complaint, but the family didn't like it, so they called the ombudsman. So now the administrator in the DON spends another two days with the ombudsman. This is why this happened. The ombudsman says to the family that, you know, it was valid. Family still doesn't like it, calls Department of Health. Now they're back, another two to three days on a complaint survey. This is how, this is why we did this. Okay, they call the family. Family doesn't like it. Now they're calling your hotline. Mm -hmm. You come back for another two days. We spend two more days going over the same issue that was solved on the first time. So I think that's where our concern is, is that maybe, and I don't think all of the time, I think like Grace said, a lot of time complaints are valid, but we look at them and we take them seriously and we fix them, but how do we fix the process where if they didn't like the first three answers, that's now 12, two, 12 days, two weeks, that you took an administrative team away for a period of the day. Okay. Any other questions for these ladies? Yes, Chairman. Every, every facility would be different. My, my hope is that my administrators and directors of nursing are resolving complaints and they're not getting a lot of them. W when they do come in, the Department of Health, I, they have a way to look at them. And if they're a serious complaint, um, or and when I say serious, I mean something like abuse um, or something like that, they're prioritized. If it's, I lost my glasses, uh, it could probably be a year Oh, for each facility? Yeah. I, you guys, how many how many complaint surveys, Tammy? Tammy is my regional nurse right here, so she oversees all of them. <laughs> it's very few. Well, I can say for Washington Center, we just had a what's called a complaint survey where a team came in. They were reviewing all complaints from January 1st of 2017 to now, and it was eight. 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 They had eight complaints. And that took me three days and about this much paper to them to show what we did, how this happened, if it was a, a true problem, how we fixed it. And they still haven't given us an answer to that. They're still reading the papers in the office now. What? This was not us. This was not us. <laughs> Please let me like, clarify. So I said, I'm like, what? I, no, I'm sitting right here in my office. And she said, oh, and did I call X amount of facility? Your complaint would be like an hour. Yes, I mean, absolutely. And, and personally, I have a responsibility if I have a complaint in-house um, that is a, a careful <coughs> violation that results in harm or um, an accusation of abuse. We have two hours to report that to the Department of Health ourselves. So it could be two o'clock in the morning, Tammy's now out of bed, Grace is out of bed, I'm out of bed, and Brooke is out of bed, and we're on the phone, and we're on our computers, and this is getting filed immediately. 
and then probably Brooke and I are in the facility figuring out what happened. Okay, Ron, you wanted to say something earlier, and then we'll go to Ron first, though. I want to point out we had a resident council meeting yesterday, and some lady was missing two days of her vacation. Now, if you want to have a meeting, Thank you very much. Ed, uh, we've, uh, uh, we've had a lot of discussion, a lot of different angles, and uh, a great input from everybody. Anybody. Is there anyone who would like to add something new that hasn't been uh, brought up? I'm Tammy Tarrant. I'm a regional nurse for Centers Healthcare, and I do cover all of these buildings, again, from Plattsburgh down to Troy, so I visit them on a regular basis. Just to give you a little background about the complaints and the hotline that they have, not only can families and visitors and whomever call the Department of Health, any of you can, or go online and fill out your report, but there is a requirement where there's regulation that states that the facility themselves has to turn in themselves to the Department of Health when, you know, there's a, um, a coffee burn or um, a demented resident slaps another demented resident or, like Lisa spoke up and said, an allegation of abuse. And we have very strict guidelines. On a Friday night at 10 o'clock, if someone says, I was slapped by a, an aide, that we have two hours to get ourselves out of bed, get dressed, get on the computer, get that report filed, and then as soon as it filed with Department of Health, we get an e email back within hours, sometimes minutes, I mean, it depends on if you're sitting there, that says, we received your complaint. Then usually, at least they follow up with a phone call back to the person that filed the complaint, if it's the facility, and says, okay, what did you find? Have you started your investigation? How is it going? Please send me everything. So they might have a send them everything that we have compiled statements or witnesses or whatever it is, we, we have to file that with them, then they can still come in and look at all of it themselves and do their own interviews and that kind of thing. But we have very strict regulations as what we have to report and how quickly it has to be done. So, you know, adding another layer to that process isn't going to change anything that we already have to do because we're regulated to do so. Okay. Okay. All right. Very good. Thank you. Hi, I'm Stephanie Smith. I'm the Director of Nursing at Warren Centers, so I just am not going to take up a lot of your time, but I just wanted to, I know some of the questions were, what are you doing to make things different or make things better? 
Um, when I started there as the assistant director of nursing, the families, <coughs> they decided that they wanted to have family council because they wanted to make things better for their loved ones. Um, and they had asked me to be the representative. They have to ask someone in the facility to be the representative. They felt that they trusted that I followed up with their complaints at the time. So once a month in the evening, on the third Tuesday of every month, I sat in front of basically at that point the firing squad. They would let me know, you know, what their concerns were, what their complaints were, what they wanted fixed. Obviously, I didn't have the answers to everything. We had 10 days to follow up on those issues. Um, so when we first started, we had about 60 family members showing up to that meeting. The last meeting I had, I had one person show up because I'm now the director of nursing. We had people from the post-star for one of, um, one of the meetings where the family was applauding the changes. You know, they were happy that there was changes. They felt that their complaints were, you know, rectified in a timely fashion. We have our grievance process. Sometimes it's, you know, minimal things like losing a nightgown and, and I'm searching through people's laundry trying to find a nightgown, but we all work together. Um, in regards to the staffing issue, I worked for a non-for-profit organization for long-term care for seven years. Nothing is different with the staffing from that building to this building. There's, there's nothing different. I, I had built a reputation in this community as a nurse. I feel that I'm respected by the healthcare population. So for my name to be associated with a, a, a nursing home that is under such scrutiny with what the post-star is posting, and I know you don't represent the post-star, but just, a, just one thing I wanted to mention is they posted an article in the paper the day before my job fair, because I'm trying to get more staff in, two people showed up to that job fair. Who is gonna wanna come work for a center when they're, they're making accusations that aren't even true. I can sit in my living room and read this paper and say, you know, that's completely, you know, th th this is not even something that actually happened. You know, nobody has even come to validate this. And, and it's frustrating and it's very frustrating because we try to work as hard as we can. My staff was literally, you know, slapping me on the back on the way here, you know, please represent us. Make sure that you let them know, like we love our job here. You know, in our residence I brought I brought our, one of our residents here because she wanted to speak as well. It's their home. So you're, you're posting in the post-star that the, that the conditions are poor, but nobody from the post-star has ever asked our residents if the condition's poor. These people live here. I mean, it's, it's their home. The family members come to me and say, you know, that's terrible. I can't believe that that was posted. You know what? I have no complaints about care. Did they used to? Absolutely. You know, it wasn't the best and, and there's not always a perfect director of nursing and a perfect administrator but you end up getting the right mixture and then the building can get better but you have to give it that chance you know it's it's a process it's trying to get the staff to be educated it's trying to get enough staff there's probably never going to be enough staff in this area to, to <coughs> be able to in in regards to the staffing centers doesn't tell me that i can't have 15 people on the day shift there is no bodies. I, I don't have those 15 people. If I could staff, you know, and, and have somebody extra to go on a run and have somebody extra to help with activities, that would be fabulous, but we can't do it. We just don't have the people. And that, forming the family council, they finally understood that. You know, I was doing job fairs. We're doing the CNA class. I am the program coordinator for the CNA class. Um, you know, I went to make sure that I got trained so I could be that person so we could hold it in our center. We went through the Department of Health so they could, you know, make sure that we could actually do that because we're trying to be part of the solution. And we want everybody in the community to be part of the solution. I mean, I was born and raised in Queensbury. I'll, I'll retire at Warren Center. I feel very passionate that things need to fix in the area, but we can't do it when we're trying to, I, I, we're constantly fighting, you know, with we finally got one step ahead and here comes another article to make it look like we're not doing the right thing when we know that we are. Well, this is actually very good. We see a lot of people on both all sides who want to achieve the same goal. So we're making great progress. We're not looking for another regu no, regulatory level. We're looking to everybody have everybody work together, finding new ways that that could occur. And uh, I think this is going to be a great outcome. Supervisor Wild, I, sure. I think we got to wind this particular meeting down. But this would be great to have everybody here. But, you know, there was a what spawned this was uh, part of the rating system. Right, so I believe the centers had a one out of a four. Two, I, I, it was actually two. It was a two. Yeah. So, you know, I think one of the things that would go a long way is to say, 
when are you going to be a three, and when are you going to be a four? Can I explain the quality measures uh, a little? Anna, there, there, there is a, an issue with a concern about the quality of care for our seniors, and we all have to be aware that there's constraints by your industry and the like. We just want to know how you're going to get there to make it better. Right. right. We had a proposal in front of this committee to do a hotline. I'm not sure where we're going to go with that. But bottom line is, what's it going to take and, and how long is it going to take for you guys to raise that level of care so that the rating system, be it from a regulatory body or not, says that you guys are doing a great job. So the quality... So I just wanted to say very quickly, though, with the quality measures for the star rating, I don't know if anybody has really looked to see what the questions are, but it's basically you're asking the residents that are due for their assessment, do you have any days where you feel down or depressed? So you have people triggering for depression who are in a long-term care facility, most short-term rehab people that feel like they lost their independence. So you get your points taken away and your stars go down, but if you put them on an antidepressant, your points get taken away and your star rating goes down. So it's not a hotel star rating. Like it, it works completely different. I mean, we, we look at everything. We look at every specific resident that flags in that area. Well, what can I do? Do they need to see the psychiatrist? Is there something like with activities that they're not? We work individually with all of those residents to make but it I better. I beg your pardon, somebody's getting those higher ratings and they're doing it somehow. is actually locked. What you're seeing now isn't even a reflection of the actual star rating for any of these facilities, not just centers, but all of them. So they they are right. Yeah. Chair, Chairman Conover. Yeah. The, the star rating in the CMS guidelines. All right. Actually, right. It's really it's hard for us to hear. <coughs> okay. And also, people who are watching the video later, they can't hear you if you're not. Gotcha. Thanks. Okay. I'm Brooke Daly. I'm the administrator at Washington. And the star rating is very a passionate topic for me because it's, it's locked. I'm extremely frustrated because I should be higher than a two star at Washington. We currently have a five star rating for our quality. But it's locked because back in 2015, we received an immediate jeopardy for a side rail that was on a bed. Nobody got hurt. Nothing ever happened. It was an incident report where uh, the way that the nurse reported it, the, the resident had their head against the head rail. And because of that, we had to go through and remove all of our side rails. Um, and we got the immediate jeopardy, and that lasts for up to three years. And so right now, Department of Health, or CMS, has locked that star rating, saying they're not going to change the way that the survey stars go. 
and what you guys need to know is we can only go one star above what our Department of Health survey rating is. So for right now, I'll never get more than a two until that's unlocked, and that's not fair. When will it be unlocked? We don't know. You said three years. So, nope, three years. It should have been already, but now they've officially locked it until an undetermined amount of time. Hmm. And it's not just this sector. It's hmm? All of them. So, once again, here's the complaint coming from, yeah. not to protract this, but we have residents, families complaining about something. Now you have the administration complaining about something. And who is the person, who are the people who we're complaining to? We're not getting, the residents, families think they're not, say they're not getting satisfaction. You say you're not getting satisfaction. Mm -hmm. We need to have visibility so that we can get these things solved. It's not you that's going to solve it. It's going to be the New York State Health Department, whoever's locking that code. Okay, I think we've covered everything. We've actually got yeah. some, uh, at the very end, some new information. Yes, as far as I like it. If I may, before sure. all discussion is ended. Um, it's too bad that the supervisor um, at large from Queensbury isn't here to see that, the one that just keeps pointing out on the low stars. It is always an eye-opener to see the people that work and, and actually put the care into things here and, and testify before us. This has been educational to all of us that have been here to um, to listen. Thank you all for attending. We know that it's not an easy job. It's not an easy clientele that, that you have. Thank you. I'd just like to to say uh, I'm Mark Lampkins I'm the environmental services director at the Guns Falls Center and uh, we do strive to, to make our home uh, a safe clean uh, comfortable environment for our residents uh, we're, uh, we've got a very ambitious uh, renovation project underway we have two 40-foot uh, construction uh, containers on the property now we are going to be uh, renovating a third of our rooms almost immediately. It's it's upon it's uh, we're, we're going to be kicking that off here within weeks. We've got an ambitious uh, PT, uh, physical therapy, occupational therapy, gyms, offices uh, renovation uh, uh, planned, and uh, we just got done recently putting all new flooring, luxury vinyl tile in all our corridors our dining room areas, our entrance areas. So uh, we are we are taking uh, great strides to improve our facility uh, physically. And uh, so I, I do uh, applaud centers for uh, providing us with that that kind of support. And that, that's uh, about all I had to hey, add. Thank you. Thank you. 
I am Claudette Royal. I'm the New York State Ombudsman. So I'm not from a facility. I am representing the Office of the State Long-Term Care Ombudsman, which is run through Albany's office. Aaron Plonka is our regional coordinator in Region 6, and our program is contracted through Catholic Charity Senior and Caregiver Support Services out of Schenectady. So we have 15 regional offices across the state, but the program is actually facilitated through the state office, not just a regional office. So I wanted to make sure everyone here was aware of what our program actually does, and we represent residents. We are not representatives of the facility. We are representatives for the residents of the facility. So everything that we do is resident-centered. If the family wants to contact us with a complaint or a concern, something that they see in a facility, we take that information, we then go to the facility, we speak with the resident to see if the resident shares that same concern. Sometimes they do not share that same concern that a family may have, and at that point we would not be able to go any further with the concern. If it was a global issue in a facility, we could potentially do it as like an ombudsman complaint, but if that resident doesn't share that concern, we couldn't look into it any further. Um, most of the time though, for, you know, families and residents do have a pretty good communication process and they have to agree on the concern. But we do have the ability to address concerns and complaints. We encourage families, any of you to contact our program with concerns or complaints that you have about a facility. You can go on the website and actually submit a complaint that way, which you were mentioning the thought process of writing things down and, and having it be on paper instead of calling, oh, I forgot that one thing. You can go on the website and submit a contact us form on there and it comes to the state office. We disseminate that to the regional office for looking into that um, concern or complaint. So I will give cards to you guys to, if you need to contact us at all, but if, does anyone have any questions about our program, what we can and can't do? Is there a hotline you can call if you have a complaint? There's an 800 number. It would dispatch you to the um, local program. It's actually 855-LITCOP-NY-L-P-C-O-P-N-Y, which is 582-678-6769. And that is posted in every facility. It's actually required by law for us to have a big yeah. poster with that information. With the hotline. For the hotline for ombudsman and Department of Health. The poster is in um, every nursing home in the state. It's the same poster with the regional information to contact and the 800 number to contact. But we try to act as a mediator with a resident. So we try to work with the facility on what the resident's goal is because at the end of the day, everybody is here because the people that are in that facility, that is their home. They are the ones living there. They are the ones that may or may not have wanted to go there. Situations occurred where I can no longer live in my home, now I'm in this facility and this is my new home and I live in a box that's eight by eight and all of my worldly possessions are no longer with me. So think about the life changes that those people go through. We're all gonna get there. <laughs> We're all gonna be there someday facing the same situation. So our goal is to help those residents try to live the best quality of life that they can while they're in the <coughs> facility. So we try to mediate with the facility staff for what the resident's goal might be. We're representatives of just the residents. Does that, do you have anybody, anybody Thank have you, Ryan. Questions? Has a comment, our administrator? Uh, yes, uh, as long as we're on the ombudsman uh, topic, it's my understanding that we're going to have a training here uh, uh, within the next several weeks. Is that is that accurate? Yeah, the plan. And I'm and this. Some more volunteers, the plan is I'm all set up in a room right next door uh -huh. to do the five-day training. This is one of our ideas on how this coalition can really be helpful. Is we can use our uh, health professionals who know people in this uh, uh, world that may be interested in volunteering. We can, we can, uh, and that's the, the role that the county, uh, in my opinion, can, can play and, and do a much better job at facilitating those contacts. So we're not a member of that you know, coalition. We certainly can be a resource for that coalition to ask questions. Like Aaron said, they are actually going to be doing their certification training here. To be a volunteer for this program, <laughs> It, it's honestly, it's stressful. It's like a job. So we, we make sure people know that up front. You are not going in and dealing with some <coughs> simple, you know, food issues, like even though they don't, are not simple, it's not always something as concrete as that. You could be dealing with, as a, as a volunteer, dealing with a food issue or all the way up to someone is being involuntary, involuntarily discharged from the facility and they don't want to be discharged. You could be dealing with an array of types of issues that help those residents and we do with those involuntary discharges. We may attend appeal hearings. We may be reaching out to other facilities and, and helping the resident with that. So it's a volunteer experience that can be very, very challenging. And most of 
the time the volunteers are doing it because they truly care about what happens to the people in the facilities. And we have about 500 volunteers across the state. We can always use more. <laughs> I think we've uh, just about covered everything and much more than I anticipated, actually. Uh, unless someone has something really pressing that we miss, I thank you all for coming. And uh, I'm sure the uh, supervisors have learned a lot. I think you folks have heard hearing both sides. All sides are uh, uh, we're smarter, and we're going to make some good progress as the weeks and months go ahead. And we look forward to uh, the progress you folks have in your endeavors to fight the federal government. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. Now we do have two issues for this committee. We have two issues. You want to take a five minute break. Uh, we will have an executive session also. Six minute break. Yes. Why wasn't this on the agenda posted? I sent a message out to everyone on the committee. Uh, I didn't expect, honestly, I didn't expect this to be this big. I was thinking it was a good turnout. 20 minutes. In our, uh, in our agenda, we're going to go with the administrator first to talk about the credit card issue on the agenda. And then we'll go to the county attorney, which will require a, an executive session. I won't say what length the executive, executive session will be, but ah, so it'll be a short executive session. There you go. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we have one item today, and uh, the Tourism Committee, which met just before this committee, uh, adopted, uh, uh, they approved, rather, uh, the idea that the Tourism Department will have a credit card. It's getting difficult for uh, tourism to do what they need to do when they're out on the road because they hit the limit. Uh, and so uh, this item that I have on my agenda would just formalize that by uh, changing the uh, credit card policy to, re to re the wording that would allow that to happen. Um, the, after the, assuming it passes this committee, it'll go to finance before it goes to the full board. I'd like to entertain a motion to support that. Supervisor Wild, Secretary Supervisor McGowan. Any other questions for Ryan? Supervisor Wild. Brian, are you in full support of this? Yes, sir. Thank you. Amanda is also in full support of this. Supervisor Bramer. Oh, I was just going to say I uh, think that it will be great, and I fully trust our employees to use it properly. <laughs> we have plenty of checks and balances in the event that it's not. <laughs> Good, thank you. Appreciate Any other questions or comments? Okay, we'll call the question. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Carried. All right, that's it for the administration. Fred. All right, uh, Mary. Don's not here, so you're okay. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would just ask for an executive session to discuss both pending litigation and um, employment status. A motion to go into executive session made by Supervisor Sokol, second by Supervisor McGowan. Okay, I guess all in favor? Aye. We are in executive Aye. session. <laughs> All right, we're back out of executive session. We made no motions other than to come out of executive session during the session. Uh, so we're in open session now, and Mary 
our county attorney, what else do you have? The last thing I wanted to address is I would really like to send out the Airbnb contract to Airbnb, and I just want to get consensus on whether I can do that. I looked at the Yes, I'm in. If you got a thumbs up with me. Okay. Do you need a motion? And no, I don't need a motion. Supervisor Hyde? Sounds good to me. Okay, Supervisor Sokol? Yeah. yeah. Supervisor McGowan, you're in. Supervisor right. Wild? Supervisor Hogan? Supervisor Driscoll? Or, uh, Leg <laughs> Leggett. Oh, God. You didn't call him Beatty, at least. It would have been Driscoll. <laughs> he was on my list. It's a <laughs> He's going down the list. Oh, yeah. Yes, and I agree, too. Okay, anything else to ring before the committee? All right, motion to adjourn by Supervisor Wild. Second, Supervisor McGowan. All in favor? Aye. 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 We are adjourned. Thank you very much, folks. Thanks for your patience, and I hope you were... Uh,